So, uh, good morning. I'm Kaz. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are in part two of a series called Centered Set Church. And if you're wondering what Centered Set means, we'll learn about this in about three or four weeks. So this is like a preview of what's to come. Uh, But the whole idea of this sermon series started from the idea that, like, look, when we go around asking people, hey, you want to come visit my church? A lot of times, there are people who already know the reputation of the church before they actually visited a church, or maybe they visited a church and they were hurt by the church and they're like, I don't want to go back. And so what happened to the church? What happened to the church? Why is it so unnecessarily unattractive? Because when I look at the story of Jesus, you'll notice that a lot of people who are nothing like Jesus actually like Jesus. And if the church is an extension of Jesus, then maybe we should be as attractive as he was. And I'm not talking about like physically attractive, although that doesn't hurt. We're talking about, there's something about like the essence of who Jesus is that draws people near to him. And the people who aren't drawn to him are the people who are like, the light is shining too bright. I can't go near Jesus because it exposes my own darkness. And if you want, if you're interested in that, you go to John chapter three. But, um, we're talking about what makes the church unnecessarily unattractive. And what we've learned is this, that most of the things unchurched people resist about the church has nothing to do with how the church is operated. It has nothing to do with how the worship songs are sang or what songs we pick. It has nothing to do with what the pastor is wearing, right? It has nothing to do with what color the, the walls are or for in, these wooden seats that are uncomfortable for some of you, right, or maybe most of you, it has nothing to do with that because if it's worth the while, then they will, you know, they will will suffer through it and it should be totally fine, right? So the church has become unnecessarily unattractive, right? And like I said, it has nothing to do with church systems. It has nothing to do with the music or the rituals or whatever, right? But what we learned over time is that when people, when you ask your friend to come to church, they'll usually say, I don't want anything to do with the church because they have observed the behaviors of Christian, right? Whether if it be like, um, like, hey, we just have to come to our church and they'll say, I want nothing to do with the system that excludes certain types of people. Or maybe you've been in a situation where you used to go to church, but the way you were treated seemed inhumane. They keep asking us to serve, and you know, I, I, you know, I had to choose between, you know, working my butt off at church, or spending time with my family. And the church wanted me to prioritize church over family. Maybe you've been in a situation at church where you felt like you were unloved, that you had to somehow prove yourself that you're part of the group in order to be one of us, right? And so it's usually human behavior that makes the church unnecessarily. Um, unattractive. So how do we fix that? Now, usually the the answer is, okay, well, let's just change our behavior. Let's just change who we are. Let's change our practices. Next slide. Practice. Let's change our practices. But we talked about last week how if we just change our practices, we're really not changing the root of the problem, right? Because you could pretend to be better people, right? You could pretend like you're like, hey, um, we accept all people. Why don't you just come to church only to find out that a few weeks in, you're like, hey, I want to serve on the worship team. It's like, sorry, we don't let people like you serve on a worship team. And you're like, wait a minute, were you just pretending this whole time? It's like, oh, no, we're not pretending. It's just that we welcome you up to a certain point. So are we pretending or are we just lying to ourselves? So what we learned also last week is that our practices are not just some things that you could just change. You can't just say, from this day on, we're gonna change the way we behave. We can't do that. Because our practices are usually informed by our theology. Or what we believe about God is what informs how we live out our faith. So if you believe that God is forgiving, right, and that he forgives all people, then we as his followers wanna become people who forgive all people. If you believe that God is accepting of all people, then we are, transformed into people who are accepting all people. But if you believe that God is first and foremost before loving, that he's actually judgmental, then we could justify the fact that we're judgmental towards other people. Man, Kaz, why are you judging me? Well, because, you know, I'm just being like my, my Lord. I'm, I'm judging you the same way that God would judge you. It's easy to justify bad behavior if your vision of God is also bad. So what we need to do is we have to relearn our core tenets. Right? We have to recover the original blueprints of what God intended the church to be. 
right? We have to study who Jesus is, and by studying who Jesus is, maybe we'll start to un- get our, our, our marching orders. We'll start to say, oh, if God is like this, then I need to be like this. If Jesus is hanging out with people who are outcasts of society, then maybe we ought to be more welcoming towards those people. Everything that we do in the church is informed by our theology. And so for the next few weeks, including this week, we're going to be talking about theology. And you're going to like, Cots, where's the application? That's coming when we get to the practice part, okay? Like, so you're like, every week I go to church, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. We'll give you small implica- like, uh, things you could do, but the big application is coming when we start talking about what this means for our church, and that's in a few weeks, so make sure you don't miss that. Now, first thing I want to do is I want to give you a little um, a theological, descript- a theological description of a system. And I'm not going to tell you what this is a description of. Let's take, put it up here. A sacred place where sacred men interpret sacred texts, which draw sacred lines to determine who's in and who is out. A sacred place where sacred men interpret sacred texts, which draw sacred lines to determine who is in and who is out. If I were to take this description and I went to the public outside, you know, people who've never been to church or anything, and say, what do you think this is? Nine out of 10 times, they're gonna say, oh yeah, that's the church, right? But last week, I, made a, I argued that this isn't what the church was meant to be. As a matter of fact, we have a, I, I coined it something else. We called this the, the temple model. The temple model. We talked about how in the Old Testament, the system that was built out of that Old Testament rule book was the temple model where there's a hierarchy and they have to follow all these rules. And so today what I'm gonna do, okay, is we're gonna look at the first century church. In the first century church, how did they organize everything? What are some of the things that they believed about God? And not only are we, not only are we going to study what happened in the first century, we're going to be looking at a letter that was written by a person who worked his way up to the top of the system of this temple model and the warnings that he has for the first century church. And of course, that person I'm talking about is Paul the Apostle. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he also wrote a letter to a a group of churches in a place called Galatia called, we call it the Book of Galatians, okay? And today, specifically, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Why are we looking at chapter 5? Why haven't chapters 1 through 4? Okay. The Book of Galatians is broken up to three parts, chapters 1 and 2, 3 and 4, and 5 and 6. 1 and 2 identifies the problem. Paul is writing a letter saying, I'm writing to you because I see these problems, Chapters 3 and 4 is Paul's solution. This is how you fix it. And chapters 5 and 6, the last two chapters, is basically Paul pleading with the church saying, please follow my instructions. This is so important. This is where his passion comes out. So this is why we're studying chapter 5 today, verse by verse. We're going to look at almost every verse. And if you want to read more, you can read on your own. It's, it's a really fascinating read. It's one of my favorite letters that Paul wrote because it's not too com- confusing. And we're going to read through chapter 5, and what you're going to discover is, and what I want you to pay attention to is Paul's heart. Okay, we'll look at what he's, the context of, the content of what he's saying, but I also want you to feel what he's feeling here, okay? That's the main takeaway from today's message, is what is Paul feeling here, okay? Now, before we read chapter 5, let me catch you up on some things you need to know. There's a church in Galatia that Paul went to, and there's a group of churches that Paul went to. Okay, and he preached the gospel of Jesus. He's like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. And everyone's like, yes. And Paul's like, yes. And then after he leaves those churches, another group of people visits those, ex- those exact same churches. Those people are called the Judaizers. Judaizers. Judaizers are Jewish Christians. So they're Christians that used to you know, live by the temple model who believes followers must still obey the temple rules. That means if you want to be a Jesus follower, and Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, you need to follow all 600 plus rules in the Old Testament. And you have to fall into the same system as the, the temple model. So that's the first thing you need to know about this letter, okay? Because Paul is gonna be talking about what these people have been teaching these churches, and he's saying what you guys are being learned, or taught by these people, try to forget what they taught you because it could destroy you. The second thing you need to know is that in this, I guess this might be PG-13 a little bit. I don't know. Okay, well, okay. He's going to talk a lot about circumcision, okay? And I'm not going to tell you what that means. Well, 
Maybe. Okay. <laughs> but I want you to know that when he says circumcision, he doesn't just mean the actual act of circumcising somebody. He's also talking about the, that circumcision represents the old temple model. Okay, so when he says circumcision, he's not just talking about specifically circumcision. He's talking about what that represents, which is the old temple model. Okay, so we're cool with that? Okay, now, just in case I lose you through this whole teaching of chapter 5 of Galatians, I want to share with you the main point of what I'm about to go, we're going to go through together in case I lose you somewhere along the way. Are we cool with that? Okay, this is what he's trying to say. If you bring the temple model into the church, it will undo God's work, okay? Just, if you are bringing in the temple model into the church, you are undoing God's work. This is the main point of what, okay, so you got your cliff notes right here, okay? Okay, so let's start. Galatians chapter five, verse one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. By the way, if your version of Christianity does not feel like freedom, then you are following the wrong version of Christianity. Following Jesus should fe be freeing for you, okay? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. This is something you should, you should stand up for. This is something you should be immovable from, this idea of freedom. Then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. What is he talking about here? You people in this church, you just came out of the temple model where you felt like you were slaves. You had to follow all these rules. There was a hierarchy system where the high priest was telling you what you're supposed to do, what you can't do. You are set free from that. Do not go back to where you came from because that is like going back to slavery. Stay away from the old system, right? So then he says this, mark my words. And okay, in the Greek language, because this was written in Greek originally, there is no punctuation. There is no exclamation mark. But these translators who translated this text, they were reading through here and they're like, the translator's like, I get the feeling that Paul is trying to go for. We need to add that exclamation mark right there. So that should just tell you something about what the translators are trying to tell you. Like, Paul is extremely passionate here. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, there it is, Christ will be of no value to you at all. No value. Now, circumcision. Paul is not saying, if you've been circumcised, you're out. Look, Paul himself was circumcised. He was a Jewish rabbi. He, at, when he was eight days old, he probably got circumcised like any other good Jewish family, okay? So, but Paul was circumcised. He's not saying that circumcision is bad. He's saying it represents like the circumcision model, the temple model, what it represents is something that, it, that he's speaking against right here, okay? And he says, if you are under the temple model, in that case, there is no value. What Christ is, what Jesus is to you, means nothing. You're undoing what Jesus did on the cross. We'll talk more about that later. Let's continue. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Very interesting point. He says, there's 600 plus laws in the Old Testament. If you were to say, you know, I'm a Jesus follower, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reach over to the old temple system, pull out the law about circumcision, and apply it in the church. When you're doing is you're actually saying, let's bring the whole thing over too then. You can't just bring one thing over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. If you do that, you're bringing the whole thing over. Right? You bring one in, you're bringing the whole thing in. Now, how do you arrive at that? We'll talk about that later also, okay? But what he's saying is, if you bring the circumcision thing, you might as well bring in the, the dietary laws, you know, things you can, you can't eat. You might as well bring back the dressing code, like what people are supposed to wear, what men are supposed to wear, what a priest is supposed to wear, what your clothes are supposed to be made of, right? You should bring back the Sabbath law, what you can and can't do on a Saturday. Um, maybe you should bring back the purity laws and the cleansing laws. Like, bring it all back. If you're going to bring in one thing, you're bringing the entire thing back. How does that work? We'll talk more about that later. Okay, let's keep going. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. He's saying, 
If you are trying to find out if this is okay, your relationship with God is okay, by trying to follow the rules, that's what it means to justify, to be justified by the law. If I were to do A, B, and C, then God will be happy with me. If that's the way you look at everything, then what you're doing is you're, it says alienated from Christ. You are pushing Jesus away. You think that by following all the rules that you're getting closer and closer to God, well, actually you're doing the exact opposite. What? What, really? Yeah, like, yeah, right? Like, people who are reading this are, like, shocked, especially people who grew up in the religious system, which I think a lot of us have, right? We're like, wait a minute. I, growing up, I was told I'm supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. And you're like, wow, Kotz, it's only been, what? It's like we're not even two days away from becoming out of the denomination and already you're preaching heresy? No, no, no. I'm reading straight from Paul's words here, okay? Okay, so he's like, if you are trying to use rules from the Old Testament so that God will accept you, like you're doing the exact opposite. And then he continues. He says, "Next, okay, you have fallen away from grace. Now, this is a key word, grace. I'll give you an example of what they mean by grace. Let's just say somebody in this congregation says, hey, Cots, it's Pastor's Appreciation Month. Uh, I just want to give you something. It's a gift card. I'm like, oh, no, no. It's like, yeah, no, no, you and your family, you guys love uh, um, uh, eating at, or going to Disneyland. So here's a $100 gift card. I'm like, no, I can't take it. It's like, no, you, no, I just want you to have it. It's just my way of saying I love you. Here you go. And I'm like, okay, well, it's a $100 gift card to Disneyland. Okay, well, here, let me pay you. Let me write a check for $100, and I'll buy it from you. Now, at that point, it is no longer a gift. It is an exchange, right? Or... If I were to say, you know what, I don't have $100 in my account, so uh, you know, I have a $50 bill. Here, $50. That gift card is no longer a gift card. It's a discount card, <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So he says, when God gives you grace, he says, I died on the cross for you, not because of anything you've done. It's a free gift that I want to give to you just because I love you. And you are saying, can I at least pay for 50% of that? by doing some things on the side so that it makes you happy. So, you know, like one day you'll look down and say, oh my gosh, Cos, look at all the good things you've done. That's why I died for you. To, you know, like, it's like, no, 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 no. What you're doing is you're cheapening the cross, the gift of God. It's supposed to be free. And the value of it is wrapped around the idea that it is free. If you had to do something to earn it, then it's not a gift anymore, right? So what Paul is saying here is this, that God's gift is unconditional. There's nothing that you did that made Jesus say, I need to die on the cross for that guy. Right? Like, I'm hanging on the cross and I'm dying for the sins of the world. Well, not that guy because he's not good enough, but that guy, he's going to do some amazing stuff. That's why I'm dying on the cross. That is not what's going through Jesus' mind. Paul is arguing here that everything that Jesus did is at a pure love. It's unconditional. Jesus demonstrated his love for all of us on the cross. So if somebody were to say to you, oh man, God must really love you. Like, look at what Jesus did for you. God must really love you, right? When you're doing things to earn it, you're basically saying, no, no, he died for people who actually earned it, right? And if you start saying that, if you start thinking that, then you start implying that on other people, right? That person didn't earn it, but this person did, right? Now, there's, there's a danger to this, and I'll, I'll share this danger in, right here. Okay, so this is the problem with it. If you paid for his gift, you assume others need to pay for it also. Let's just say you did A, B, and C, and because of that, God died for you on the cross, right? Then you start to expect other people. You're like, did you do A, B, and C? No, well, then Jesus didn't die for you. Did you do A, B, C? Oh, you did D also. Oh, okay, well then, right? And it starts to become this, become this hierarchy, right? Or another thing that could happen is this. I did A, B, C, and that is why Jesus died for me. Did Jesus die for you too? Oh, he did. What did you do? Just A and B? Wait, how come you got the same thing I got, but I did more for it? Do you see how a hierarchy system could start building? Because when you get to the beginning of the New Testament, when you read about these religious rulers, all they're doing in these stories are they're just comparing with each other who deserves to be in God's grace and who doesn't. It creates a hierarchy. Paul continues. For through the Spirit, 
we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Paul here is saying, if you want to know about good deeds, doing good things, just keep in mind that he did everything for you for nothing, for free. But if you become a good person, it's because of that that we become good. God's gift for you came first and your good deeds came second, not the other way around. Not you did good things, therefore he died for you. It's he died for you, therefore now you're doing good things. He's, he's trying to get that straight. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or un, nor uncircumcision has any value. He's like, you're trying to earn brownie points and God doesn't do brownie points. Follow the law, don't follow the law, it doesn't matter to God because there's no way that you could do anything that would make him love you more or, or less. There's nothing you could do that would say, that would make Jesus say, you know, I shouldn't have died for you. There's nothing you could do that would make his love for you less unconditional. Now, next, I'm gonna put up a crazy statement. And if it wasn't from the Bible, if I just showed up at a church and I just said this out first, right? They're gonna be like, that guy, we need to burn him at the stake, okay? but. <laughs> It's not my words, it's Paul's words, okay? Now, and he also, in this one statement, also addresses the fact, that the reason why the church is so unnecessarily unattractive. This is what Paul says next. The only thing, what does it say? The only, only thing, only thing, I mean one thing, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You mean, Paul, you mean like, you know, out of the 10 commandments, here's the one thing that really, no, 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 no. Not out of the 10, the only thing. There's only one thing that God looks at right now, and it is love. If you can get love right, then you got the whole Jesus thing down. Well, what do you mean by this? Like, you're like, you mean just one, just only one? Well, what about like thou shalt not, like those, like no, no, just one thing, love. Because in the temple system, right? When you don't have that unconditional love, or maybe there was, but they just didn't know about it, right? You're always looking up asking God, am I good with you today? How am I today? Am I, am I in your good graces today? Do I have your favor today? Did I do enough for you today? Are you angry with me today? You're not going to forgive me for that thing I did today, right? Like you're always wondering where you stand with God, And because you're asking God all the time, am I good with you today? And you're not hearing anything back, what happens is you look for a person who might have those answers. And so you find a sacred person, like a priest or a pastor or a guru or whatever religious background you're from. And you ask that person, am I good with God today? And usually in the temple system, what they say is, well, if you do A, B, and C, then you're gonna be good. But now Jesus declares, and Paul is reinforcing this idea, you don't have to go to some sacred person to find out if you're good with God because you can always know that no matter what your life circumstances are, God is always for you. God will always love you. There's nothing you could do that will make him love you any less because in the very first place, you did not deserve to be loved by God, but he loved you anyways. And so there's nothing you could do that could take that love away from you. So in case like, you're like, so how does this work in practice? I, I just wanna share with you, here's a little diagram, okay? So if I'm standing here, which I am, okay? And in the Old Testament, there's clearly commands that talk about how we should love God, like the first five commands of the, of the 10 commandments about loving God, and the last five are about how to love others, right? There's clearly commands about how to love God and love others, okay? But if you have these two commands, love God and love others, which one takes priority? What do you do when these two things actually conflict against each other? For example, um, a few years ago we did a movie series on uh, the movie by Martin Scorsese called Silence, right? In that movie, there's this, the, the big conundrum in that movie is this, right? You either renounce your faith and I keep torturing the people or you renounce your faith and we stop torturing the people. So what do I do as a person in between? Do I love on God and not compromise or am I supposed to and, and let these people suffer? Or do I love on my neighbor and renounce God, right? And in that movie, what we learned is that by loving others, you're actually loving God, right? So, but the temple model doesn't allow for that. The temple model is if you have to choose, neglect the people around you and be focused on God, right? 
The new model that Jesus is presenting here looks like this. Next slide. Oh, the temple model makes you ask questions like, how am I doing with God? Am I doing enough for God? Or, and sometimes these two questions lead to this question, which is, is that person over there in or out with God? Right? Does God approve of what I'm doing right now? And you always seek out these sacred people to give you the answer for these things. And they usually give you some weird line somewhere saying, if you you know, are on this side of the line, you're good. If you're on, yeah, okay. So let's go back to the next slide. Okay. So if you're in this situation, right, the new model says this. Next slide. The image of God is in every single person around you. By loving on the person that's around you, you are not neglecting God. You are actually loving on God. Love for other people is the same as love for God. In, in theological circles, we call this the Imago Dei theology, where it means we believe that God's image is in the person next to you, so if you love on that person unconditionally, then you are worshiping God. This is what Paul talks about in the book of Romans, which we eventually get to when we do a series on Romans, maybe like in two years or something, right? But, um, but he says like the actual act of worship is being a living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means... Instead of sacrificing animals for God, start putting other people ahead of you and love on them, and that is your act of worship from this day on. Yes, sing songs, that's great, right? And I love it when we sing songs in this church, but your true act of worship is how you treat other people. So if the questions that were asked in the temple model is, am I good with you? Is that person in or out? Um, did I do enough for you today, God? If those are the questions of the old model, the new Jesus model, the question is one question. What does love require of me? If this is a question you ask daily, then you are good with God. And even if you don't ask this question, God is like, you might not think we're good, but I'm still good with you because it's unconditional. Now, Paul is making a big argument here. This is the thing he came to Galatia and he taught these things. And after he left, a bunch of Judaizers came in and said, no, 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 you still have to follow the 600 plus laws, right? And so Paul is like, okay, how can I illustrate this to the people in Galatia to make sure that they don't get this wrong? So he comes up with this illustration, which we might not appreciate, but back then, you know, we don't, um, some of you might bake your own bread. I don't, so I didn't understand this the first time I read this, but he uses this quote. Next verse, he says this. A little yeast, which is a single cell uh, fungus, right? Sounds gross when I put it that way. A, A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He says, when you take dough and you just put a little pinch like that, it changes the nature of the entire dough. Apparently, that's what I learned. I Wikipedia did. That's what I said it does. Never done it before. Okay, but what the Paul the the point that Paul is making is this: it only takes a small dose of the wrong thing to corrupt the whole thing. You take one single command from the Old Testament and drop it into the new one, and it changes the nature of the church. So he says, be careful. You bring in one thing, you bring in the whole thing. Eventually, it changes the church. So Paul, after saying this, this is what he says. I'm, convinc- uh, is co- I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. It's like, I'm pretty sure you know what Jesus really stands for. I hope that you don't listen to the Judaizers. The one who is throwing you out in, into confusion, Judaizers, whoever they may be, hint, hint, Judaizers, will have to pay the penalty. It's like God is going to have some choice words for these people because they're taking something beautiful that I created for the world, the church, and they're contaminating it. They're making it to something that's not meant to be. They're trying to pull it back into the temple model. Now, this, this phrase down here, I'm like, Paul, you okay? Like, you angry, Paul? <laughs> like, you're starting to sound a little, uh, you know, like, you sound like you're really angry at these people. It's like, oh, are you kidding? You think I'm angry? You haven't seen, nothing, you haven't seen anything yet. Look, look at the next verse. This is where it gets really, like, climax. As for those agitators, these people, these Judaizers who's telling people they need to get circumcised, I wish they would go the whole way. What, what, what? I'm afraid to ask, Paul, what do you mean by go the whole way? He says this, and emasculate themselves. If you're going to be cutting, snip, 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 I wish they would just cut the whole darn thing off. Are you guys feeling what Paul is feeling right now? See how, how passionate he is about this? I mean, if you think Paul is going extreme here, he has a good reason to feel this way. Now, you might not be as passionate about Paul uh, as, as Paul is here. 
But Paul has experience. He's like, guys, I used to be in the temple model. Not only that, I was at the top of that game. I was the one that was pushing everybody to follow these rules. I was at the top of this hierarchical system. And I know how this, this, this story ends. Like, guys, I've been in the temple model long enough to know the outcome. And for those of you who are new Christians in the Church of Galatia, you don't know where this could go. Like right now you think, oh, it's, it's harmless, right? Just, you know, get circumcised. Yeah, not, not a problem. Yeah, obey the Sabbath, sure, right? Like it doesn't seem like a big deal, and Paul says, but it's a huge deal. You don't see it yet, but I've seen it. I've been a part of it. I actually orchestrated it. I know how this story ends. There are some outcomes of the temple model that I need to go over with you. So he says, okay, let me tell you what's going to happen. Okay, the first thing that's going to happen if you were bringing one law is that the law establishes a hierarchy. So let's just, okay, it's uncomfortable to talk about circumcision, so let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the Sabbath law. Okay, Sabbath law. Let's just say, like, we're, you know, 600 plus laws, we'll leave it over there. But, you know, I like the Sabbath law. Let's kind of bring that in here. Then what happens? Well, we've seen this happen in the New Testament. Hey, uh, what did you do on Saturday? Uh, you know, I was like, Relaxing on my sofa, um, I went for a walk, got some ice cream. What did you do? Well, I'm just curious. When you say you went to get ice cream, how many steps did you take? I don't know, about 400 steps. Like, well, I took 300 steps yesterday. I was like, whoa, now that's real resting right there. Another person comes with like 300 steps. You know, I realized that by getting ice cream, I'm actually making somebody else work. So I didn't even make, I, I didn't even get ice cream. I just went to the fridge and took whatever I thought was, was edible and just ate that, and I only walked inside the house. Less than 200 steps. Like, whoa. Like, look at you, man. You're even holier than I am. Like, right? And then all of a sudden, when you have laws, you start to have a scale of the holiest person and the least holiest person, right? Or let's not talk about Sabbath. Let's talk about purity, right? God has chosen us as a pure, as a whole clean group of people. So what did you do yesterday? Oh, I was hanging out with my friend. Like, wait a minute. Is your friend one of the chosen, one of the elect people? No. Well, then he contaminated you. Oh, what did you do? I stay away from everybody that didn't look like me. It's like, oh, then you maintain your purity? It's like, yes, I did. You know, like, well, what were you thinking? Well, I was thinking this. Like, oh, no, that's an impure thought. What did you do? I totally vegged out, didn't think about anything. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, right? I read the Bible all day. It's like, oh, right, right? And all of a sudden, you have this competition. A hierarchy gets set when you bring in one little rule from the Old Testament to the New Testament, right? And when that, that hierarchy is established, all of a sudden, you have people at the top and the people at the bottom. And the top of the hierarchy determines values. So eventually with the hierarchy, you have somebody who is considered to be the holiest of the group and the least holiest, right? So the person at the top obviously is closer to God. So that person will look around and say, you know what, when it comes to um, sins, I think the sin of lying is less severe than the sin of divorce. People have asked me like as a pastor, like, hey, God, so why is it that Christians are way over the top about sexuality? but not so much about greed. It's like somebody ordered it in that way. The Bible didn't, right? The Bible talks about how all sins accomplish the same problem, like same thing, right? But it's like these people at the top of the hierarchy apply value. Like, okay, this sin is worse than this sin. So boom, boom, lying is less sin than, so you could lie 10 times and you could divorce once and that's worse than this, you know? Like they, they create these scales artificially, right? Not on your parents is less severe than stealing. Who made that rule? Somebody at the top of the hierarchy made those rules. We see this actually playing out in Jesus' day. Jesus is at a synagogue, and it's a Sabbath. He's not supposed to be doing any work. He sees a person who is ill. I think he had a shriveled hand in the book of Mark. There's a person who had a shriveled hand. And Jesus is thinking, I need to heal that guy. I have the ability to heal somebody who isn't well. But in order to do that, I have to break the Sabbath law. And so Jesus is thinking in his mind, I think the Sabbath was designed to help people, so I'm going to help that person. And as soon as he heals the person, the synagogue hierarchy, the people at the top, the synagogue leaders look at that and says, you just broke the worst command, of the, the, the most important command, Sabbath, because Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath is a worse sin than he, not healing somebody on the Sabbath. Like, they create this hierarchy. 
Who creates this hierarchy? People at the top, because people trust these people to be holier than everybody else, right? So what happens when you have the top of the hierarchy determining values? Then you eventually end up drawing unnecessary lines. So if you don't, you know, they give you a scale, like there's an A, A minus B, you know, B plus, B minus, you know, whatever. And then you're like, but anybody under a D is out. So, if you don't look like us, if you're not practicing the things that we're practicing, you're out. If you fail at these sins, you're out. But these sins, no, you're still in. Do you see how just bringing in one little thing could create an entire system that is designed to keep certain people out? making the church unnecessarily unattractive. So, Paul, he warns us, when you bring in something from the old and bring it into the new, you're, creating us, creating, you're bringing us back into a system of enslavement. So Paul continues, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Like I said, if your version of Christianity feels like enslavement, if it doesn't feel like freedom, you bought into the wrong version of it. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul is saying really, he's making a really good observation here. He says, I understand that a lot of you, your morality comes from these laws in the Old Testament. It says, do not steal. And you're saying that we can't bring that into the new one. So does that mean we start stealing? Right? Like, it's like Paul's like, no, 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 you're missing the point. Remember, we are not bound with these laws of the Old Testament, but we are now bound by this one law, which is love. Right? And let me just explain to you what that looks like. And so Paul says this, for this reason, for, okay, he says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. What's that one command? Not the whole 600 plus commands, right? This one new command is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that you need to know about Jesus, everything you need to know about being close to Jesus is fulfilled in this one law. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the Old Testament laws, right, pointed up and sideways, up to God and up to others. And he's like, but over time, it all became about just up and down, about this vertical relationship. And we've neglected the horizontal. He says, from this day on, Church of Galatia, I don't know what the Judaizers just did to you guys, but I just want to remind you guys, our focus is now on loving other people. And by doing that, we are actually growing closer and closer to Jesus. So you don't have to ask the question of, how am I doing today, God? How am I doing today, God? The question should be, what does love require of me. Now, I probably like split the crowd today because some of you are like, hey man, we've been waiting for this, right? And the other half of you are like, like, what are you doing to the Old Testament, Cots? Like, <laughs> well, it's not me, Paul did that. I'm just picking back off what he said, right? But it is hard to let go of the Old Testament laws because we grew up on the Ten Commandments, right? So why is it so hard to let go? We're gonna talk about that next week. There's a psychological aspect to it. Um, but today, so we'll talk about what we should do instead of you know, hanging on to the Old Testament laws. But today, I just want you to focus on this. Paul was passionate about this. He was doing everything he can with words to warn the church, do not cross that line. Do not go back and bring something from the old and drop it into the new. There is a danger that you're playing with here. And if you've been a part of church for a long time, you know, you could probably have memories of this probably, where you realize, oh my gosh, this, the church I used to be at, or you know, the church that I'm at right now, or maybe even this church, we brought some of the old stuff into the new. And Paul says, be careful of that. He says, the most important thing the only thing that we should focus on is love. Love for others. Amen? All right, let's pray.